Take some time, meet somebody new, say hi. Happy Mother's Day hugs all around. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to the moms in here. If you're uh, kind of new around here, um, one of the things we don't do very often is, uh, um, well, actually on Mother's Day and Father's Day. Uh, we don't do special sermons on Mother's Day and Father's Day because I got, I got angry mail years ago that I went too easy on the guys, but I was difficult on the moms. Like, what? So anyway, I, and I realized, gosh, you almost feel like you're repeating yourself. So uh, I did get a chance to listen to uh, Andrew last week. Uh, I actually get a listen to the, got to listen to the podcast. And so what I wanted to do is kind of a follow-up on his, and then we'll get back to John next week. But uh, a couple of things very quickly as far as the bulletin is concerned. Um, there's not going to be a Sunday evening service tonight in case, uh, I don't know if they announced that, it's not in the bulletin, but uh, we always take both for Mother's Day and for Father's Day uh, to take out moms and dads for, for dinner or for whatever and kind of give you the evening to do that. And then with the uh, positions at the school, the, uh, the two that are there, the, there's two that are mentioned, there's one in particular that they're looking to fill and uh, what we're wanting to do around here is when it comes to positions in the school, we always want to have them staffed, really we're, we're concentrating on that more and more, to have them staffed from people or by people from within the fellowship because it is simply the school is the largest by far. It's the largest ministry within the church, except for what goes on on here in a, on a Sunday morning. But as far as the ministries are concerned, the school is by far the very, very largest one. And so we, um, we want to make sure that whenever we have ministries, that we have it staffed, whether they're volunteer or paid positions, that they come from within our church because then those people have an investment in the, in the building. And it's, uh, it, it's just very important to us. And then also from the, uh, the doctrinal side of things, we know that the people who are serving are of like mind. And so with that, we have uh, um, the positions that are opened. Uh, Renee will be uh, getting a chance to do the uh, going through the applications and everything when she's back. Right now, she and Mario are celebrating their wedding anniversary. And so they're out of town, but when they come back in, she'll start looking through all the different applications. But if you are interested, then you can get an application through the school office. And uh, we want to make sure, once again, that uh, we're doing those from within the church. So if you're wondering about it, then there's nothing, there's no harm done in filling out an application. And then you can talk with Renee about those positions and what they entail. So with that, we're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 2. And we're going to look at chapter 4 as well. So um, what I wanted to do following up on what Andrew was talking about last week, you know, this, this what we call the body of, of Christ or the church. What is it that comprises the church and how are they made up? And I will say this, I'm sure this wouldn't come as any great surprise to anybody hearing me, but the church in the 21st century I don't think looks a great deal like the church in the first century. So we'll see that by just looking at the text that is before us this morning. You'll kind of see that. But it got me thinking as well um, that I was, uh, as I was gone last week, I was at a conference uh, with other pastors and leadership. And uh, it's the, the, to me, the, the best of the leadership and pastors' conferences that I can think of, they take place there in Wisconsin, up in Appleton. And so I was with them. But we stopped by the, at another church earlier in the week, and uh, it's where we kind of start our journey up there, and without embarrassing them or, or you know, drawing attention necessarily to the church, there is one that we go and visit, and uh, they have a, what I would consider as a very much a first century kind of a feel around that church, and, and here's why. We came in to that church about an hour and a half early, and, uh, uh, or they do, I should say. We got there a little bit later, but they're there, and they bring food. And so they have dinner together before the service starts. 
So you see people just kind of scrambling around and everybody's having dinner together and, and uh, then they head on into the church for church service. They close with a song, but then they all hang out afterwards just to pray. So the whole church sticks around after service to pray, which is kind of interesting. But, uh, you know, you would think that's what churches do. But, you know, a lot of times we're in our hurried state of things. We're rushing out the door. So then they hang out and they fellowship for a while. They're here for easily a good hour, hour and a half after the service lets out. And they're still just hanging out. Well, that was kind of cool. And then when I was looking where they're all eating, I had noticed there's a little place, a little alcove in their building where they have a bunch of clothes up on racks. And those clothes are brought there by people that either don't, you know, they don't, they don't fit into them anymore, like their kids or whatever else, but they don't want to just give them away. They bring them to the church because at that church, they're having a bunch of kids. So this is California. We don't have children anymore for the most part anyway. Just kidding. But they're basically, they're, they're doubling the size of their church through their children's ministry. It's amazing. They're just everywhere that you look. And of course, we know that, you know, purchasing clothes and everything, it's not cheap. So... They bring in their clothes so that people in the body can get them. And then there's food that they have on shelves and people can come and take what they need. And pretty much anything that a person would think is of value, it's not junk, but it's stuff that they're not using, they bring into the church because somebody else may have need of it. And uh, pretty interesting, one of the things they have up on their wall is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, which we'll get to in a moment. But it is the one that they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, and then in the breaking of bread and prayer and fellowship. And so they have that up on their wall, and it's one thing to put it on the wall, but it's another thing to live it out. So what I thought I would do with you today, as we talk about this body of Christ, or this church, and these members, the things that Andrew had spoken about last week, I thought it would be kind of fun to take a look at the first century church and some of the things that were going on there, and how it was functioning. So with that, chapter 2 of the book of Acts Let's, uh, let's turn there and let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word that you've preserved for us these 2,000 years later that we wouldn't be left not knowing and, and without knowledge, without understanding. We pray, God, that you would give us skill in our, our hearing of your word and, uh, and in the application of it, that we would be dependent upon your Holy Spirit as we read and as we understand, as we come to know. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We ask that you would have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In chapter 2, it, it really kind of um, is, is a follow-up to one particular verse that we actually see in chapter 1. So let's look at that real quick because it's probably maybe even on the same page. But in chapter 1, verse 8, as they were there and waiting, the Lord appears says, now you will, you shall, down the road, you are going to receive power, and when's that going to happen? Well, it's when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and then into Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. So he says to the apostles, the time is going to come when the Spirit will be upon you. He's going to be sent, and it will be a recognizable thing and from that moment, when you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, then you are going to be a testimony. You'll be witnesses of who I am and what I do, not only here, but in the surrounding areas, and then eventually into the whole part of the world. Now, there is, there is confusion in some churches, thinking that they had not already received the Holy Spirit. They were born again at John chapter 20, when Jesus breathed life into them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. These are the same people who were here at this time, and Jesus says, now there's a time coming also when the Spirit will come upon you, and then you're going to be witnesses. We see that take place at chapter 2. Now, in chapter 2, there are a series of events. As we look at our world around us today, I want to do this in light of Acts chapter 2 and then Acts chapter 4. When we survey the world around us, and even if we think about it in our country to start with, and then we think about it in the rest of the world, we think about values and the things that are important to us. And the things that are important to the church, if we look at it in a biblical sense, they are not carefully followed in the rest of the world or from the outside part of the world, and that's to be expected. The world's not going to agree with us, but it is becoming, I believe, increasingly hostile towards what we believe. And again, as we look at our political world, I mean, we're only a few months away from a presidential uh, uh, election that's going to be taking place, and I think it's pretty obvious to say that values have changed. 
we not only exalt immorality, but sometimes amorality. We just don't seem to have a position on things anymore. And yet the Bible's not silent on these kind of things. The Bible is very, very clear about what God expects and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. And so when the society doesn't agree with those things, that's to be expected. Now, what that may end up ultimately costing the church is another thing entirely. We live in a world that is in increasingly hostile towards a biblical worldview, and it's beginning to take root here even in this country, but we're kind of oblivious to it because we're so far behind the curve. But other places in the world, you can't even greet one another and meet with one another in public as a Christian because it'll cost you your life, or at least imprisonment, just for saying the name Jesus or speaking about him. Well, it's not as though this is new. But since we are somewhat, if you will, kind of distanced from it, it hasn't happened yet in this country, we, we can sometimes forget that it's happening elsewhere. But as I size up the rest of the world, and I think of the competing worldviews in a religious sense that are really on the increase and on the march, Christianity is not among them as far as all the outward things that you see. When you find it reported, you don't look around the world and say, man, Christianity is really doing so much good and there's so much happening in the world. The trajectory is wonderful. Now, the underground church is doing a phenomenal job. It is doing a wonderful job because those people are so genuine, they come to the Lord realizing that it may cost them something greatly, maybe even their lives or that of their family. And if under that threat you are willing to continue on with the Lord no matter what, the purity of that believer is going to be amazing because they realize that this world can do anything to them except take from them their faith. And it's genuine. That's a first century church, by the way. That's what happened here with this group of people, because from what we know of history and of these people here, of the recognizable names and faces that were part of that early church, most of them paid the ultimate price for what they believed. They were put to death because they would not renounce, because they would not reject Jesus. And for those people in the world that like to mock the Christians and say, eh, you guys are just in it for the money. And the, the reason that the church did what they did was because it gave them power and it gave them prestige, it gave them all this stuff. Well historically none of that's true it's actually totally the opposite and if you were in their place and it really was just a big sham and a joke and a lie do you think that they would have followed through with it to the point of death doesn't make a lot of sense does it so Jesus says you are going to be witnesses when the spirit comes upon you there is going to be something very different about you and so we see it in these early chapters now chapter 2 begins with this same thing we've all read it before and so it goes from uh, verses, let me, I just actually wrote them down so we don't have to, we're not going to read every single verse of it. Uh, the Holy Spirit promised, as we just seen there in chapter 1, verse 8, and another one that we'll uh, mention as we close. But as we look at this promise, or this Spirit being sent, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And now we won't read them, but we probably know the story. The Spirit comes upon them, they begin to speak with other tongues, and they speak with a, a foreign language, but... Unlike what we see oftentimes portrayed on television, this uh, was done and the people who were there heard it and recognized it because they said, you know, we're not from around here and these guys are and so there's no way that they could have our language and yet they do. And so they're speaking in a language that these people are able to understand and it was glorifying and praising God. That's what happens. Now, of course, we have immediately thereafter, uh, found in verses 5 to 13, there are the scoffers. And the devil loves to plant these kind of people when God does something really miraculous. Then the scoffers come out to try to draw attention away from what just took place. And so what was their first thing? Ah, these guys are drunk. And so Peter sees this and says, no, 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 look at what time of the morning it is. They haven't even had time to start drinking and getting like this. Now, just let's put it in its proper understanding. And so Peter at that point, from verses 14 to 21, he reads and recites back to them from the book of Joel, the prophet Joel, chapter 2, saying this work of the Holy Spirit is something that the Old Testament prophet Joel had spoken about. And he gives a great deal of specifics. In fact, he even says that all of this, he, he quotes so much from Joel that he says these, these miraculous works of the Spirit are beginning now and they'll continue all the way until the day of the Lord when he comes back. And so for those that would say that the Spirit and the work of the Spirit is done and it was done since these early days, well, it's not the way that Joel sees it nor is it the way that Peter was dealing with this work of the Spirit. So we get that little part there and then we see 
there is this idea of evangelism. So what happens from this? In chapter 2, as, as Peter uh, quotes from Joel, we get to verse 23 of chapter 2. And so here is where he gets to address the people. Now, we don't ever see in the early church especially an opportunity for evangelism and for giving a context and an understanding to an event. We don't see them miss those opportunities. They see them as opportunities and then they, are, they, they seize it and then God gives them the words to speak. Now notice what he does here in verse 22. Peter stands up, men of Israel... These uh, now, now hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to or attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Now, there is the beginning of the context. What is it that we are seeing here? Remember, Peter was there when Jesus said, you're going to receive power. And so we sometimes get into this place of it's always got to be the, be the big light show and it's got to be something that's over the top and everything's got to be crazy, right? What's going on here? But Peter is endowed with power to speak evangelically. He's not doing anything crazy. He's not drawing attention to himself. God has gifted him with the ability to evangelize. And evangelism is a gift of the Spirit. To God, God gave to some to be evangelists. Remember that Paul is talking about the different gifts of the Spirit. Evangelism is of them. And here Peter does this. He's not one of the guys speaking in tongues that we know. He's the guy that is given the ability to speak evangelically. And so he says these things. Jesus that you know did all the signs and wonders. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and you've crucified him and you put him to death. So he holds them accountable for what they've done, but also to realize that all of this was done intentionally. God had always planned for it to be this case and this way because Jesus was here to save sinners and going to the cross and being put to death was part of the program, if you will, or it was part of the plan. And so it was nothing more than all of those things coming to pass. And then verse 23, verse 24 rather says, Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Then he goes on to quote some from the writings of David. And so as we continue on through this chapter, we get to verse 36. He talks about God raising him from the dead, and it's an exaltation. And then he comes to verse 36, and he says, Therefore... Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he is the master, he is the sovereign of things, the Lord, and he's the Christ, he's the Savior, he's the Messiah, he's the anointed. So that is for them to understand that everything that you're seeing right here, this work of the Holy Spirit, happened because Jesus did the works that he did, and he has sent his Holy Spirit like he promised that he would do, David has also had his attesting of the fact that the Messiah would raise from the dead. And so now he says, so therefore, therefore, let all the house of Israel know. Here is who Jesus is now that you've seen all these things take place. And look at verse 37. This is what happens when there is effective evangelism. Rather, Verse 37 says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter said, and to the rest of the, uh, of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So the people are hearing this. They said, they look at Peter, they look at the apostles. Okay, you've, you've convinced us. What is it that we should do? And so notice what he doesn't do here is doesn't hand them a book. Doesn't tell them that they need to go and watch this on YouTube. He doesn't tell them that they need to join up with this particular church or this particular model or anything else. What does he do? He looks at them and he says, you to an individual, you must do this. Peter says, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism isn't an essential to salvation. You can find that taught clearly throughout the rest of the scripture. Baptism has nothing whatsoever to do with salvation. Repentance does. Repentance is a turning away from sin, and it's an acknowledgement that we need to be saved from our sin. We turn from, we repent of, we embrace this world and everything that it has given to us at, just from birth. It's the way that we've always been. We release that embrace at some point. We turn to Jesus and we say, I embrace you. I embrace what you have done for me. I, I, I distance myself from everything that I have been. I now turn to you. It is not something you can do both. 
You can embrace the world and everything that has been and embrace the Lord at the same time because there needs to be forgiveness and a repentance away from what you've been and an acceptance of what you now are. And so Peter says this. Baptism, of course, doesn't change a thing other than it shows an outward identification. Now, furthering from repentance and that identification with the Lord is that we get the Holy Spirit as well. He's given to us in salvation that he indwells the believer. That born again uh, thing that we have been speaking about in chapter 3 as we've been going through the book of John. But what has taken place here in this work that the Holy Spirit does through the believer is in addition to the idea of just being saved. And so then he says to these people, okay, what you've said, Peter, it's so convicting to our hearts. We're so convinced. What then should we do? And so again, it's not join the church, pay your tithe, pray. Not all the stuff a lot of times we hear. Repentance is a recognition that you are a sinful person, as all of us are. But there is the need for forgiveness and cleansing of that sin, and it comes by repentance. That begins the process. And so he says, this is what you must do. Well, notice what ends up happening at verse 40. With many other words, he testified, exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Now, as the church teaches that message, we will continue to be marginalized, and, and it, it's a polarizing message, let's be honest. Because if you're going to repent, you're going to repent from what? From a perverse generation. Again, I look at the world around us, and I have to ask, when I look at the religious side of things, when I look at how polarized our own country is, and just eight years ago, or so, so much, when we, when we had elected our, our current president, we were told everything was going to start to change because we were too polarized. And there was too much hatred of one another. And it's worse now than I've ever seen it in my life. I see more division within the church. And that division really goes down to what it is that we believe, not just what church we belong to, but what do we teach so in every conceivable way that I look, and this may sound pessimistic to some, the trajectory is not good. It's not as though everything's getting better. It just seems to be going in the opposite way. And so as I say that, I don't get all distressed and depressed about that. I just go, no, the Lord told me it would be like that. What should I expect? I'm not troubled by that, not by a long shot. Because if really I believe what the Bible teaches, this just means that the Lord's coming soon. I'm okay with that. I hope you are. I have nothing that moors me to this world. I'm not anchored here. Heaven is my destination. So whatever happens here and now is for him to be concerned with. We're supposed to be doing just what we're doing right here. But not just within these walls. We're supposed to be doing them outside as well. We're supposed to be doing as Peter did. Hey, here's an opportunity. Let me talk to you about Jesus that was, that was put to death but resurrected. And he has sent his Holy Spirit that we could know these things. Because we turn from the things of this world, we repent and we come to him and he does these amazing things in our lives. Now notice what ends up taking place in verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So notice again, it's the receiving of the word of God and everything that that you know, calls us to, or if you will, kind of commands us to do, once we become obedient to the things in his world, and his word rather, and we leave the things of this world, we begin to identify with who he is. And then that's how the church grows. It's not because we go through a membership class. It's not because of anything that we do. It is simply becoming changed and transformed into his image as we are growing in our understanding of him. How do we grow in our understanding of him? But through his word. And so, look at this. Verse 42, once again. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, that would be the first thing that set them apart from the rest of the world. Because here are the apostles, and what do they know? Well, they know everything that they learned from the Lord. Who, even if we read just the, the four Gospels, if we carefully read through everything that Jesus ever said and knew it backwards and forwards, it would take the rest of our lives to have a good reckoning and a full understanding of just what he said in what's recorded there. John's Gospel says, look, what I've told you in these chapters that I've written are just the surface. If I was to tell you everything that we heard and saw and everything that he did in our presence, there's not enough place for me to write it all. There aren't enough volumes that could be written that would entail all of it. 
But he's given us, if you will, the highlights. I've given you what you need to know, is what John says. And so these people took in those three plus years of what they heard from Jesus and they're passing it along to the rest of the church. And I find this to be such an important thing because again, you hear me say it all the time, you'd be amazed at the stuff that comes across my desk of how to build your church. And some of you maybe heard me mention it before. This is no kidding. They tell me how I can make sure that there's not an empty seat in this place. And I know exactly what the, the program is. There's no way I'd ever do it. Because it would mean we'd have to get away from the Word of God. I'd have to start patting people on the back and tell you everything's just wonderful. Forget what the Bible says. The other thing is that they tell me how to get a better tithe out of you. Do you know that? I can browbeat you into making you think that God's poor. And that if you hold it to yourself, then you're going to be punished because you don't give to him. Oh yeah, I, I get that stuff all the time. Do you know that I even get it where they, they have these little portable things that you can pass them through to the people and they can swipe their cards and tithe with their credit card? I get that stuff. I got the one that says instead of having the offering box in the back, it can be a kiosk. Yeah. And see, we're even kicking around the idea, let's just stop taking offerings and people go ahead and just do it on your way out. Because it's not about money. It's not about any of that stuff. This is a church that if you'd have, even if it was around at the time, the technology, if you said, hey, look, you can grab a better tithe out of your people if you just pass around this little swipe it deal. They would have said, forget it. That's merchandising the flock. Forget it. So anyway, the first order of business, they continued steadfastly in what Jesus instructed them. Now, there are three other things that are mentioned right here. And it says, in fellowship, Breaking of bread, prayer. Those three things. Fellowship is the common bond between brothers and sisters in the Lord. Breaking of bread meant that they, they would get together for a meal. They would you know, sit across a table from one another and they would partake. And then the prayer would come after, well, we have these things in common. This is what God has done for us. And so we understand the doctrine that Jesus said one of the many things. That he said, they will know you by what? How will they know you? What will they know you by? Your love one for another. Other things that were, it was obvious who they were. But that was one of the things that Jesus said to the disciples. The world will know who you are by your love one for another. Well, you don't get together and talk about doctrine, have breaking of bread, fellowship, and then staying around to pray with one another unless that first thing is taken by, you know, by understanding what God's word had to say given to us by the apostles, by the ordained plan of God. Jesus came to earth, instructed his disciples and apostles, and they went out and continued that work. And the effect that it had was that they understood what it was that they believed. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but maybe you have at some point in your life thought, is there not more to church than just studying the Bible? Maybe you've told people about the church that you go to and they say, oh, I've heard of that church, but all they ever do is teach the Bible. I've heard these things said, by the way. When I was around here before I was the pastor, I had friends come here and they said, is this what you guys do every week? Yeah, Wednesday nights. So you guys, you guys study word for word all the way through a book? Yeah. And so they're surprised by that. Is that all that there is? Well, yeah, that's all that they had. And I would say that for all the entertainment, if this world changed tomorrow and our country changed tomorrow and it became very, very difficult to be a believer, all those little entertainment kind of you know, community centers called churches would empty out in a hurry. What would be left are the churches that stick to God's word because it's the only thing that is going to give comfort and peace to the believer in a difficult world. That's the truth. If you don't believe it, look at how it is in the rest of the church in the world where it does cost you something to be a believer. So this body of Christ thing that Andrew was talking about last week, this, that there are different, you know, parts of the body. I, I heard his, his story about, you know, the finger and all that stuff, the one that was, how many of you were here last week? And yeah, so he was talking about, he was working in a kitchen, saw a guy lose his finger. I'm just going, oh my gosh, that's so gross, Andrew. But that's Andrew. He loves that kind of stuff. He's crazy. Loves the Lord, but just, you know, he, his, his visuals are just amazing. Well, <laughs> he loves talking to my wife. I heard some of the other stuff. He, my wife works in the criminal courts system and hears all kinds of horrible things about what people do to one another, and he's just like a child. Really? Really? Yeah. So anyway, don't, nobody tell him I said this. So. I'll tell him myself. 
What was it that, that held them together? What was it that inspired the believers in those days? It was to say, here's what we have in common. What Jesus taught to his apostles, that they in turn taught to us, that we will in turn teach to others. This is what the church was supposed to do. They weren't con uh, concerned about marketing and they weren't concerned about you know, what model and what mode, what anything else. Here it is, right here. Look at verse 43. So then what happened? Fear, reverence. It came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. The same things that Jesus was able to do. Remember there were times when he said, if you don't want to believe what I say, look at the things that are taking place because they don't happen on their own. And those signs and those wonders were supposed to give credibility to the message. Because if you're going to say something, but something supernatural has happened that gives real weight to it, it's hard to ignore, right? So this is what was taking place. And so these signs, these wonders that were done through the apostles. Now verse 44. Now all who believed were together. They had all things in common. Sold their possessions and their goods, divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord. That means that they were in agreement on these things. It says, in the temple, in the breaking of bread, house to house, they ate their food with gladness, with simplicity of heart. Now notice once again, they didn't become some kind of a doomsday cult that found a place up in the mountains and they just waited for the spaceship to come pick them up. They went to the temple every single day. They went to where people believed. But they gave better indication of, well, don't stop just with what you've known in the Old Testament. It was talking about a Messiah that would come into our midst. And they were saying, this is the Messiah, Jesus, the one that you put to death, who was raised from the dead and has now sent his Holy Spirit. You see, they weren't stagnant. They weren't saying there's the world and then there's us. They knew that there was the world and that was, there was them. But they went out into the world to make disciples. Exactly what Jesus told, right? He didn't say make converts, he said make disciples. And we all realize there's a difference between those things, right? Any of us who came into a knowledge of Jesus, that moment that we cried out and said, God, forgive me and cleanse me, forgive me of my sin, you're a convert at that point. A disciple is the one that says, but I don't want to stop here today because that's not enough. I want to know who it is that I've just given my life to. What does he expect of me? What comes next? What can I, what can I look forward to? That's what disciples begin to ask. And so these people were. And this is what ended up happening with them. Verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all people. With all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Isn't that cool? It's the Lord who builds the church. It's not the model. It's not the mechanism. Now you might be able to, by something that you do, put people in the seats. That's not building a church. Just getting people to come to the church and sit in the seats does not make the body of Christ. It does not make the church. It does not make the believers. What comes from the understanding of the word, what comes from the apostles' doctrine and our changing through that and the exposure that we have to his word, how we become disciples is what builds the church. And it was the Lord who did the work anyway. So it's not as though they had to wait a couple thousand years for the church growth models to really start to build a church. It was being done by the thousands at a time because they were faithful to the word. Chapter 4 gives us a little bit more information, but it starts at chapter 3 and we'll close with, the, with these verses. Chapter 3, a miraculous healing takes place and we see it uh, spelled out for us really in the first seven verses. Let's just look at verse, uh, verse 2. There was this man who had been lame from his mother's womb, and uh, he was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from the people who entered. Now, who, this person, this, this man who had been lame from birth, he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, and he asked for alms. That is one of the things that was expected. Tell, help the poor. Give to them as you walk by. And so, uh, fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, now take a look at us. Notice he says, not just going to go by passively, take a look at, at me, I want to say something directly to you. Focus your eyes here, he says. Now, <laughs> this means that he knows God's about to do something really amazing. Because he's saying, I want you to pay attention, we're not going to do some little hocus pocus and like throw spaghetti against the wall and hope it sticks. God has told him we're about to do something amazing. So he says, now look at me. Now, I, I don't know about you. Man, what would it take for you to really know enough that God's about to do something really amazing that you would say, look at me. I'm going to tell you to get up and walk. 
Can you imagine? I don't know about you, but my palms get sweaty just thinking about that. That makes me nervous. So he says, look at us. Verse 5. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Wow. Now, for those people that say, well, you've got to have faith to get healed. There are churches that build entire doctrines around that. And if a person doesn't get healed, then it was on them and not the guy that was doing the hocus pocus stuff up on stage. Did this guy expect healing? He was expecting money, right? As just, he had no clue what was about to happen. God simply wanted to do something miraculous, told Peter, tell that guy to watch you and look at you in the eye and say to him, I don't have anything of a material sense, but I got something that is far greater than that. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. So he says, or so it tells us, verse 7, and so he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And so he leapt, he's leaping up, stood, and praised God. Well, of course, if you're, <laughs> this is happening at the temple, of course you're going to get some notice, right? People are going to be kind of jaws dropped. They see this guy. They're walking past him every single day. He's in the same place. And so they're just probably mouth agape. What are you doing? How did that happen? And then notice in verse 12 what we get from this. So Peter saw it, responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Now, that's got to be one of the craziest questions that ever was asked by man, right? Would you not be blown away by this? The guy's either been faking it since he was a kid or something way beyond your, your you know, first-hand experience has ever seen. You're seeing a man who could not and had no strength in his legs, and we all know about atrophy. Even if he was to be made whole, you can't support that. You don't have the muscles to do it. But instead, everything is recreated on the spot like that, and this man is able to stand. And so Peter asks, why are you, why are you so surprised? Why do you look intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we've made this man walk? Can you see he's already setting it up? I'm going to tell you about Jesus here. Because if, if not for him and without him, there's no way that this would have ever taken place. And he begins to tell them that as we see at verse 17. Then he goes to the point of, look, if, if the signs and the wonders were the only thing, then everybody would be walking out of here just mind blown over all the rest of that. But notice he says, no, no, no. This man being healed was to get me to this point at verse 17 because this is all that matters. That man who had his legs given back to him and was healed, even though he, it, it appears as though he was really right on as far as the Lord was concerned, he realized all the truth behind this, he died later, as did all of these people. They didn't live forever in those bodies. So this man who was made whole at some point died. But what's important is what happens on the eternal side of things. That's the focus. So verse 17 says, now, though you've crucified Jesus who made this man whole, just know this, verse 17, brethren, I know that you did what you did in ignorance, as did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, has thus been fulfilled. You guys did exactly what the Bible said was going to happen. The Messiah would come here, he would teach, he would do the things that he did, and then he would be put to death. So you were just acting it out. But notice that he refers to it as ignorance. These things you did in your ignorance. Verse 19, so what then needs to be done? Repent, therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, and that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he would send Jesus to you who was preached. So there is the promise. Repent, therefore, and receive him. Then look at verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things, which God foretold by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. What an amazing thing. That Jesus that you put to death and that God raised from the dead has made this man whole. And oh, by the way, he went to heaven, but he's not staying there. He's coming again. The restoration of all things. As I watch the world, yeah, and I'll say it, melt down day by day, I don't lose heart in that. I look at it and just say, this is exactly what God had intended. The days are upon us. So I'm to be at the place of looking up. Well, this is what takes place. There's this incredible, you know, um, there's this amazing bit of evangelism that takes place. We fast forward to chapter 4. And, of course, after this great work of the Spirit and these people coming to get saved, 
Notice what happens. It, it, it immediately brings about the, the uh, anger directed at the, the uh, apostles. And so the, the religious guys, the pointy hats, decide that they're going to have their go at them. And so, of course, they bring them in front of all of these people. And notice at verse 8 it says, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and he said to them, rulers of the people and the elders of Israel. This is his way of repeating back to him basically the same thing that he said at every other one of his addresses, Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised from the dead and we've seen him. He says the same things over and over and of course what does it do? Look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They marveled. Hey, these guys didn't go to seminary. How can they possibly speak like this? They're not seminarians. Isn't that what we know as far as you, you can't be a pastor, you can't be a, an evangelist, you can't be a whatever unless you're educated and you've got your seminary degree? Look at what it says. They marveled, but then they realized that they had been with Jesus. You want to know what a disciple looks like? It's not your diploma. It's not your pedigree. It's not any of that stuff. Have you been with Jesus? Do you know who he is? Are you on a first name basis with him and do you communicate every single day? Are you like him because you've come to know who he is, because he saved you and you've repented of that, what you used to be? So verse 13, amazing thing. Boy, I don't know about you. If you don't have that one underlined or some, something that draws your attention to it, I mean, this is, this is bulletin board worthy stuff right here. They had been with Jesus. Could be up on your refrigerator or something where your eyes are drawn to it all the time. But then look at verses 18 to 20. So they called them and they commanded them not to speak. This was after they, they put them out of the room and said, we've got to figure out what to do with these guys. Now, that's not, this happened several times. These guys are in front of them. They're thinking that they can intimidate them. Instead, they just keep going in reverse. And all the guys with all of their threats are not having the, the desired effect. So they send them out of the room. They call them back in, verse 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to him, you be the judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and that we have heard. That is what we call boldness, and it's not just something that we're born with. That is boldness that comes from knowing who the Lord is and what he's done. So for us in this world, again, every day that goes by, I just see that the world becomes a bit more hostile day by day towards the believer. How do we know what the believer is? Well, we're getting a good look at it here. These are people who are willing to stand upon the word of God, would never deny the Lord because they saw him and they knew him. And they recognized there was something much bigger at play here. And so the report of these guys, look at verse 29. They get let go. They were warned to stop with the Jesus stuff. And then verse 29, here's what they say as they get together. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and the signs and the wonders that may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Want to know what a church looks like that's got it together? Right there you have it. Right there you have it. The world hates us, wants us to be silent on the truth of God's word. God looks at that and says, it's not what I've asked you to do. It may cost you and you may get pulled in front of the muckety mucks, the guys with the pointy hats, the real important people, the elites. So what? Are you going to be faithful to what's been said here? Look at verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were with one, of one heart and of one soul. Neither did anyone say that they had any of their things that he possessed that was his own. But they had all things in common. What an amazing thing. I grew up in a church pastored by a man who lived in the communes. <laughs> You've heard me talk a little bit about it, but these guys, this was communal living. The guys worked, and everybody, every one of the guys brought their stuff, their paychecks and all the rest of it, and they put it into one community pot. It paid for the place where they lived, the lights, the, you know, all that stuff. They got a, a weekly um, allowance of 50 cents. <laughs> Tells you how long ago that was. 50 cents, man. You can't even buy a cup of coffee anymore. Uh, but anyway, all the rest of it went into evangelism. They rented equipment. They rented places to go out and do music and to go and preach the gospel. This is what they did. Well, here we see 
They didn't have any possessions, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was upon them all. What an amazing thing. They are talking about the true and living God who was dead and yet lives. How many things could be written about what the church is supposed to do. But do you notice that it's a very small bit of, uh, uh, you know, collection, if you will, of things that the church did? They testified of Jesus, that he was put to death according to the scriptures. God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. He's alive and indwells the believers and he's coming again. Amazing. It doesn't have to be complicated. Man has complicated it since, unfortunately. Uh, just a couple of things because we're way over time. John chapter 14 in verse 15 to 18 is where Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit and says he will be in you. There's a time that's coming. Uh, John chapter 16, verses 1 to 4, same thing. Speaking about this work of the Spirit in the believer and the effect of Jesus making known to us who he is and, and who he is as far as the Father is concerned and the relationship that we can have. That's all of John chapter 17. So when you look at those things, once again, we'll close with this. 1 John chapter 3 is where we read about, uh, beloved, it's, it's not known what it is. In fact, you know what? It'll only take us another 30 seconds. Let's go to it. It'll be a nice little summary of what we've looked at this morning. First Peter, or First John, rather, chapter 3. The first three verses help us to understand exactly the point. First John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children. Very reminiscent of what he says in chapter 1 of his gospel, at verses 11 and 12, where he just talks about he came to his own and his own did not receive him, but to those who did receive him he gave the right to be called the children of God, to be numbered among them. Well, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. John's gospel tells us those same things, chapter 16, chapter 17. The world doesn't understand us. Well, verse 2, beloved... Now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we will be, but this we know, that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he, Jesus, is pure. So, to all of you who are here this morning, as you hear those words, ask yourself very simply the question, is there this hopefulness of seeing him, an expectation that, who knows, maybe it's even today, do we look forward to seeing him? Is that a fearful thing? Do we believe that he's coming again? Do we even know him in the first place? That's what will tell you whether or not you're part of the church, the body of believers, not whether you sit in the pews, but whether or not you are his. Could you, whether you're as articulate necessarily as Peter was, would you be able to say the same things? We believe that Jesus was, that he is, that he was put to death, that he rose from the dead, and that by ascending he was able to send his Holy Spirit, that we could walk through this life knowing if that's your life, well then praise the Lord. That's great, because we can be here in this place and comfort one another with these words and these truths, but we're supposed to take them outside these doors. It's not for us to continually take in, but it's to give out as well. If you're in here this morning, and this is like new to you, and you've never come to him, and you don't see him as the one that is the, the, the risen Savior, who has come to save you and is done that work, that there is still that need for repentance, there will be people down here to pray with you and for you about that. So again, as, uh, as we heard from Andrew last week, so we see again today, putting it in its proper context, what does it take to be part of this body, this collection of believers? Here you have it, those verses, and then how it was affecting those people called the church. Let's stand. And let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you once again for your word. Grateful for what it teaches us. Grateful for what we can glean. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be attentive to your word. The thing that made the church what it was before there were the four walls as we think of it, a collection of believers, people that came to an understanding and a, a knowledge of who you are, who abandoned the things of this world that they could have that relationship with you and then with one another the thing that made them who they were. We thank you for your faithfulness, and we thank you for your word. I pray for those who are here this morning, if they know you, that you would encourage them and help them to reach out to a world that is just dying right in front of us. For those who may not know you this morning, Lord, I pray that what they've heard and what they've seen in your word would work in their hearts, draw them forward, that they may come to know more, asking you into their lives that they may be saved. 
We thank you. We give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen? God bless you.